Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Steph, one of the lecturers for the U of T uh, Med Financial Literacy Curriculum. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Adam Panasiewicz, who was a former investment manager with over 15 years experience in the investment industry. He does not have any conflicts of interest and is not currently seeking investors or clients or selling investment products. Now, I know that investing is one of the most requested topics from learners, so we will be making a few lectures on the fundamentals of investing. Today, we will be going through basics like how to read a stock quote to how a professional investment manager thinks through and analyzes an investment. Finally, we will go through a case study looking at real companies. Normally, I would introduce the guest lecturer. However, Adam, I think you have a really interesting path that our students would benefit from listening to in your own words. Great, thanks, Stephanie, appreciate it. Uh, so thanks for taking the time. Um, this is me. I, um, I was born in Poland. I grew up in Toronto and um, my path to investing kind of took a side route through medicine first. Um, I, you know, perhaps like many immigrant families, uh, becoming a doctor or a lawyer was kind of the path that was set for me. And so I pursued medicine. I, I did enjoy it. Uh, I ended up getting into the University of Toronto medical program, but I kind of took that letter to my father and said, look, it's clear what books are on my bookshelf and they're all related to business and investing. I think if I really am honest with myself, this is what I love and this is what I want to do. So uh, thankfully family was understanding and um, I pursued a bunch of entrepreneurial ventures. I started a business in university that was um, a website for students. Um, and then right out of University of Toronto undergrad, um, I joined a startup hedge fund. And Worked there for three years, uh, building the business, um, and then went to Harvard Business School to do my MBA um, around 2009 to 2011. Uh, really enjoyed that. I can talk to some of the students I met there. One of my close friends was also doing the MD program at Harvard at the time and also did an MBA. Really interesting perspective, how he bridged the two worlds and gained a lot of tools there. Um, but anyways, after, HBS, I went back into the investment management field um, up until now, basically, at a few different firms. Now I manage money privately. But when I met Stephanie and I heard some of the good work she was doing in terms of financial education um, with, with doctors and, and nurses, I said, you know, this is something I'm really passionate about. I have friends who are doctors, lawyers, and I see how they are sold investment products. And despite a lot of expertise in their domains when it comes to investments, it's the wild, wild west. And unfortunately it's made to seem very complicated, but I'm trying to simplify it here uh, in terms of the investment world. So that's the purpose of this PowerPoint, um, this presentation is just to simplify a complex world. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of uh, where we'll, what we'll do today. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, I'm here today to just give you a basic understanding. If you do choose to pick stocks on your own, this is kind of the PowerPoint for you in the presentation. Uh, we're going to look at the qualitative factors when you're picking a stock. You know, obviously Tesla is very popular in the news in the last couple of years. So how do you pick a stock like Tesla? You know, first of all, just to fast forward, you probably won't. Okay, so um, these are very unique circumstances, stocks like Tesla, um, but. We'll go through some of the qualitative factors. How do you think about a business? How do you think about a business in the future? Some quantitative factors, you know, investing is you buy something today in the hope of getting more in return in the future. So the entire analysis is very qualitative and quantitative, a lot of art and science. And then we'll do a case study. We'll go back to simple companies everyone's familiar with, Costco and Walmart. We'll go back 10 years and say, okay, what would have you have had to have done back then to um, predict what would have happened. And I think you'll see how even with simple companies like Costco and Walmart, it's an extremely difficult exercise. Um, so like Stephanie mentioned, I have no conflicts of interest. I'm not here to sell anything. I just manage money privately. Uh, I'm not looking for investors. I do own stock in Costco, um, but I'm not here to talk about the future of Costco. Like I said, it's a case study in history. Uh, so I'm not recommending the stock, um, but this is an important disclosure just to help you understand that this is educational only and I'm not here for any, um, I'm not selling anything. 
Um, so just before we begin thinking about how to pick stocks, uh, this is a statistic that I think is, if you're only going to take one thing away from this presentation, it's that 95% of the professional stock pickers over a long period of time end up doing worse than the stock market. So I think perhaps many of you know what an ETF is. An ETF is the lowest cost way you can just buy the entire stock market. And so when you think about picking stocks on your own, you have to be humble enough to realize that the people that spend often 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, picking stocks, 95% of those end up doing worse than the stock market over a long period of time. I think it's 90 or 95%. And so you just have to think about that before, you know, you hear a friend at a dinner party that bought Tesla and you want to do it yourself. So just think about how hard this is. And, you know, you're always going to do better. I mean, 90, 95% chance you're going to do better just with the do nothing strategy. This is a very rare industry. Perhaps, I don't know, if you're a doctor, I can't imagine 95% of your patients being better off not seeing you. I don't know if that makes sense, but this is how unique this industry is. Like the professionals do such a disservice on average to their clients that the clients, i.e. you, me, Stephanie, are just better off buying ETS. And so one of the common things that I hear from friends is, hey, I had a buddy who bought Tesla or they bought crypto or I want that, okay? And that's a very common human emotion that even the smartest, you know, academically trained individuals kind of can't ignore. And so when you hear of someone that buys a stock and it goes up three, four times, you want that. So then that's why you start picking stocks. And I'll tell you for sure, the friend that bought crypto, at a thousand and now it's 50,000. That's such a rare instance. And the other thing you don't know is how much money did they put in? Was it a hundred dollars? Was it $10,000? Most likely they sold before the whole you know, stock went up. And so they didn't make as much money as you think. So try to ignore that. And you'll get that not only at dinner parties, but a lot of the financial advisors will try to sell you stock by saying things like, you should get into this stock because my friend already made three times their money on it. Again, just trying to pull on your human emotion um, and just be cautious around that. So three articles here I found that are just interesting. I'm gonna highlight them quickly. You can Google them later. Uh, the first one is where I got the data that over 90% of professional money managers over 20 years underperformed the stock market. So again, why are you going to be any better than 90% of the people that do this full time. Most likely you won't be. Um, another fascinating study on Peter Lynch, he's one of the most famous investors. They looked at investors in his mutual fund, retail investors like you and me, and they found that even though his fund did something like 20% a year for 20 years, the average investor in that fund did, I forget the number, but it was far less. Let's just say 10%. So how is it that his fund did 20% a year and his investors did 10? It's because they bought in at the top every time it was going down. And then when it started going down, they got scared and they sold right at the bottom. And then it started going up again and they would buy too late. And so this goes back to my earlier point. Even if you do pick Tesla, it doesn't mean you're going to benefit from the full upside of the stock. It might start falling. You will sell too early, et cetera, et cetera. It's an incredibly hard game. And the last one there, uh, last study there just talks about how human emotions have such an impact on investment returns, kind of like what I was saying with the mutual fund example here. So be careful. This is an extremely hard game. Um, so there's two main factors to consider when looking at a potential investment. Again, we'll go into a historical case study of two simple companies, Walmart and Costco. Every business, its purpose is to generate more in revenues than in costs. Kind of like many of you have, you know, private practices. You want to generate more in income than you have in uh, more in revenue than you have in costs. And then the other thing you have to consider is what are you paying for that potential future stream of income? So, um, you know, Tesla is going to produce how many cars in the future? How much money are they going to make per car? That's fine. Let's say they achieve that goal, but then there's a price you're willing to pay for that business, and that's what you see on Yahoo Finance and stock charts that we're going to go through soon. So, you know nothing is worth infinity dollars. So there's something between zero and a very large number that you're paying for this business and you have to consider what the right price is. 
Um, there's a bunch of really good websites that are simple to use and easy to understand. I've listed three of them here. Uh, Yahoo Finance, ticker.com and adam.finance. Very good for just going through historical information about the revenues and costs of various companies that you're looking at. And there's also regulatory filings. Each business that's listed in the US or Canada, you've heard of New York Stock Exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange. These are markets where stocks are listed. Um, thankfully, we've got really strong regulations in US and some in Canada too. And all these businesses have to fire, file their financials quarterly by law. Um, and so you can find all the historical numbers there uh, at these two websites I listed below. Um, so let's look at, oh, excuse me, let's look at um, an example here of Costco versus Walmart. Um, the first part I want to focus on, I said two things matter, right? Earnings and valuation. So let's focus on earnings. So earnings, you go to Costco, um, you know, you buy toilet paper, that's the revenue from Costco. And then Costco has some cost to that product. And then there's a spread between the two. And then the, using that spread, they have to pay their employees. They have to pay, you know, the utilities to keep the lights on. And so at the end of the day, they make some net income. And that's, I'm sure you know, that's what earnings are. And Walmart is the same basic business model. So that's why it's helpful to, uh, to compare the two here. On the left side here, I've shown you uh, basically what the historical earnings of these two businesses have been. Um, earnings, just the caveat there, the per share, every business is has a number of shares outstanding. Um, and so usually the way Wall Street looks at earnings, you'll see sometimes, you know, when earnings come out, you'll see headlines like Costco misses earnings by five cents or, you, you, you know, that means it's per share. So if they made a billion dollars, and they have a billion shares outstanding, that would be $1 uh, per share of earnings. So here I've shown you historically, you can see Costco's earnings have been more steady and going higher every year versus Walmart's kind of plateaued in 2013, 2014, then went down, came back up. And the point of this is you can see if you had this information, let's say back in 2014, let's say you had perfect visibility into the future, you could probably predict based on earnings that Costco's share price would do better over time. Again, over the long term, a business is worth what its earnings end up being. And so as Costco's earnings have gone up, so has the share price. Walmart's earnings have been kind of flat. They've had some struggles internationally, a bunch of other things. You can see Walmart's share price on the right there has underperformed Costco. So again, with perfect information and visibility in the future, you could have predicted this, but that's obviously the hard part is predicting the future. So let's go back to 2013. This is the case study. Let's predict, let's pretend you're in 2013. You don't know the future. You shop at Costco and you shop at Walmart. You're happy with both experiences. What would you need to do? What kind of work to predict the future or to understand whether one or the other is a good investment? Things like customer preferences, you know, what do you feel like when you walk into a store? Do you feel like Walmart has better prices? Costco, you know, at the time, Amazon was very uh, aggressive and popular, still is. Uh, Target was coming to Canada. I think many of you may remember that. That's a new competitor for Costco and Walmart in Canada. Obviously, these are global businesses. The other thing you have to consider is the profitability. I mean, just because they can sell something at a certain price doesn't mean that's set in stone forever. If Walmart started competing more aggressively on price to draw in more customers, then Walmart or then Costco would have to lower their price. And so um, you have to consider in 2013, 2014, what does the profitability of these companies look like 10 years into the future? And then lastly, you know, can these businesses grow? Obviously every year people are gonna be buying more groceries and more stuff, but um, can they open more stores? Is their markets fully saturated? Like how many more Costco's could they open up? How many more Walmarts? Um, so these are all very complicated questions to answer. Um, let's do the next slide. So um, when you were doing this kind of work, I gave examples here of Yahoo Finance on the left and uh, ticker.com on the right. Just some examples here to show you what all this stuff is. In Yahoo Finance, you would click on the financials tab and it would show you the historical numbers. 
And you can export that into Excel and you could play with the numbers just to say, okay, who's growing faster historically? Um, who's making more money historically? Um, and then on the right here, you would click on that part of ticker and you would see um, on the bottom there. In my experience, uh, ticker is just a little bit more user-friendly with more data historically, but uh, I think you do have to pay 10 or $15 a month to access um, more data. So I think the skinny version of ticker is about the same as Yahoo Finance, but if you want 10, 15, 20 years of history of data, you have to pay. Um, and then also there's some graphing tools that you can play around with there at show. So the second thing you have to consider is the valuation. So let's say you go back to 2014 and let's say you perfectly predicted that Costco was gonna outgrow Walmart in terms of earnings. That's great, but then how much of the share price today already reflects that expectation of the future. Um, so the challenge here is every time you buy a share in the market through your Quest Trade or you know interactive brokers or whoever through Scotia I Trade or whoever, someone's selling you that share, and you have to ask yourself why is that person who's probably smart, uh, capable, <clears throat> selling that share to you? And so that's the you know the battle in the stock market every day is why are you smarter than the person that you're selling to or buying from? And um, it's a humbling question to ask. Oftentimes, it's a very difficult answer, but it's something you need to understand. And so uh, let's, let's go forward here. I'll show you some <clears throat> information. This is a slide of today, but um, not back in 2014. But this will kind of give you a sense of when you're looking at it. Let's say you're in 2014, you go to Yahoo Finance. What do all these numbers mean? So at the top, you get the, the name of the company. Um, usually it'll show you what the stock is doing at that point during the day. Um, it'll show you, you know, various things about, um, let's say you wanted to buy the stock. That's what the bid ask is. So uh, someone uh, who wants to sell the stock would only be willing to sell and part with it at $525 in this example but the person buying is only willing to spend $522. So that's the bid ask spread. Um, when you do go into, uh, if you do have a um, trading platform like Scotia iTrade or Quest Trade, again, I'm not recommending one. These are just random names I'm picking. Um, just be careful when you buy a stock, you'll see a pull down menu when you put in, let's say you wanted to buy this example of Costco. I mean, this is on February 8th, so obviously it's irrelevant, but let's say you wanted to do this. Usually by default, it says market order. And market order, you just tell the bank, just buy it at whatever the price is in the market. I wouldn't do that uh, for a few reasons. One, you can Google what a high frequency trader is. Often that information is sold to hedge funds. And so the hedge funds will quickly you know, pay a small fee to your broker for that information that, hey, Adam wants to buy Costco in the market. They'll go buy it in the market and then sell it to me for a higher price. And that's legal, uh, surprisingly, in the United States. So what you should do is you put in a limit order, uh, it says, and then you tell your broker, I do not want to pay more than, let's say, $522. And then you know you're getting the price that you want. Um, you know, we're dealing with small pennies here. It's more just principle, I think, that you don't want to uh, get a worse price uh, than you could. And again, it's not going to be large dollars, but just if you want to avoid having your order sold through high frequency trading hedge funds and, you know, getting a worse price, just put in a limit order. And then especially Costco trades billions of shares every day. If you're dealing with much, much smaller companies here, you can see the bid ask spread. 522 to 523, it's only $3 difference between the two. For some much smaller companies, the bid ask spread can be much wider, much, much wider. So uh, that's where you get very dangerous when you just say market order, because if the spread is much wider and you sell that information through your broker, you know, kind of unknowingly to a high frequency uh, trading hedge fund, uh, then you will stand to lose much more money on that. Uh, then you get various other informations like how the stock has done over the last year. Volume is just how many number of shares that have traded uh, that day. So in this particular day, over 1.4 million shares have traded. Um, the dividend yield is, so Costco pays a dividend. 
the 0.61% only says that if you bought one share today, let's say one share is $521, you'd the dividend would only be 0.61% of your investment over the next year. It's not that much. Um, beta is a academic term. It's basically says how much the stock moves in relation to the market historically. It doesn't tell you anything about the future. So beta less than one means the stock is less volatile. Beta more than one uh, is more volatile. So here, uh, this academic ratio basically says that the stock is less volatile than the stock market, which for something like Costco, which is pretty boring, makes sense. I'm sure if you looked up something like Tesla, the beta is probably much more than one given how volatile that stock is. So going back to our example here of Costco versus Walmart, um, the last kind of details here is the market cap. That's the valuation that I've mentioned. Uh, how much is the stock worth? In this case, on this day, Costco is 230 million. The PE ratio is one more thing I wanted to talk about. This is going back to valuation. This is how much you're paying um, in relation to the earnings. So PE ratio here, you're trade, you're buying the stock at 45 times its earnings. Just, just for reference, I had a friend who was buying a dental practice. He was paying five times. Okay. So the market is because Costco is a big company, you can buy it and sell it every second. Uh, people pay a lot for that stability, for that ability to get their money back at any time. Just in context, the entire stock market, when you buy an ETF right now, is roughly trading around 25 times earnings. You're paying, you know, uh, you know, 25 times whatever the American group of businesses you're buying. Um, I mean, that's expensive. Uh, just for historical context, um, when the stock market peaked in 1999, 2000, it was trading at 35 times earnings. Uh, Costco today is trading at 45 times. Now that might be okay. We'll talk about that in a second. Like what do these numbers mean? You know, in 09, when the market crashed, the stock market got down below 10 times earnings. And people thought that was cheap, but of course the world was on the verge of perhaps financial calamity. So what's cheap if, you know, the world ends? So it's it, it's a range and it's not as simple as saying 30 times as expensive and 10 times as cheap. I was just giving you some historical context um, for what these numbers mean. But Costco is trading this high because uh, the market is suggesting that there's a long visibility into their future growth. So people are willing to pay more for quality and that's why it's trading at 45 times. I'm not saying that's the right price. I'm just telling you why sometimes stocks trade uh, at really high PE ratios. Um, so going back to the quantitative and qualitative, in other words, art and science, um, let's go back to 2014. So if you thought, actually, let's go back to today, for example. Let's say you do your work right now and you say, okay, I think at some point in the future, Costco can earn $20 per share of earnings. So you would download your financials from Ticker or Yahoo Finance. You do some more work. Again, we don't need to get into the details there, but let's say you forecast that in the future, they're gonna make $20 of earnings. And you go to Yahoo Finance, you see that it's currently trading at 45 times its earnings, the price to earnings ratio, the PE. Um, so you multiply 20 times 45, you get 900. You say, wow, the stock's at 500 today. That's a good deal. A uh, couple of things you need to consider. Um, this is the art part, is when will they earn $20 per share? It makes a big difference if you get your $900 price target correct five years from now versus 50 years from now, because obviously it takes much longer to make that return. The other thing is why is that 45 times PE ratio correct? And that's the science part and it's very complicated. 45 times, uh, the gravity of the stock market is interest rates. So the interest rate environment dramatically impacts what the price earnings ratio is. So just uh, to nerd out a little bit, right now, the US government bonds are trading at 2%. Okay, so if you give your money to the US government, they're gonna if you give them $100, they're gonna give you $2 every year, which 2% the inverse of that is 50 times. So effectively, you're buying a US government bond for 50 times earnings, and you're not going to grow that $2 interest 
every year. You're just going to get for 10 years, $2 per year. So some might say, wow, I could buy Costco at 45 times earnings. Let's just make the numbers easy and say it's also 50 times. But Costco's earnings are growing every year. And so in a vacuum in these two examples, Costco is the better deal because their earnings grow versus a government bond doesn't grow earnings. So again, that's in a vacuum. Obviously, interest rates change every day by quite a bit. If interest rates went up a lot, then Costco stock at 45 times might look expensive. If government bonds suddenly yielded 10%, you know, then Costco would be extremely expensive at 50 times earnings. Um, so it's, it's, I don't mean to complicate the situation, but I'm just trying to articulate how difficult the art and the science of this exercise is. So back to 2013, at that point in time, Costco was much cheaper than today. It's price to earnings ratio was 25 times and Walmart was 14 times. Now, without any qualitative analysis, the quantitative would say Walmart is cheaper. But you can see in the future, Costco's share price actually did better. So Costco, despite having a higher PE ratio, was actually more, it was cheaper than Walmart, if you will. Um, so again, cheaper isn't necessarily better. We saw in a couple of slides back that Walmart's earnings kind of stopped going up versus Costco's continually went up. And so we see what happened today. People put a higher price earnings multiple of 45 times on Costco and also their earnings went up more. And so you see the result of the share price in red going much higher. Uh, the last consideration I wanna give you is Walmart and Costco example is, I think I made it probably more complicated than it needs to be, but it gets more complicated than that. Something like you may have heard in the news, Tesla or Square, Netflix, they're very popular stocks now to talk about. Uh, they don't actually have much earnings. They're investing so much of their revenues back into future growth that you can't really apply a price to earnings ratio. There are many others I mentioned, EV to EBITDA. There's a couple of other ratios that I don't need to complicate the topic here with, but these stocks are way more volatile because they don't have actual earnings. People are constantly debating what the future looks like. And so the stocks will move around much more violently than something like a, like a Walmart. And this is where I go back to the example earlier. If you meet someone at a dinner party that bought Tesla 10 years ago and they made 20 times their money, uh, it's not so certain. The stock is so volatile, it's very hard to hold on to something like a Tesla all the way through all the ups and downs. Um, and then the other thing to consider, just a helpful um, case study here, you can actually see what the CEO, the CFO, you know, the chief financial officer, what are they doing with their shares? So Peloton was a popular stock um, during COVID because everyone you know, bought exercise equipment for their home. You could go to this website here that I listed and you could have seen that um, they call them insiders, CEO, CFO, chief operating officer, chief legal officer. They were selling stock, a lot of it, the entire time. It's just a helpful diligence tool. Even, you know, if you went and did the exercise, and said, wow, you know, I love Peloton. I'm very optimistic about its future. And then you saw that management was selling a lot of stock. It's just an, another question you need to answer. And the flip side of that is when you see management buying their stock. People sell the stock for various reasons. They could have gotten a divorce. They could be giving some money to charity, um, whatever. But when you buy a stock, there's only really one reason you buy it. And you think it's a good investment. So just something to consider. You can also find through this website, you know, which shares are being bought by the insiders, by the CEO and CFO. That's a great sign. Um, one last thing I'd leave you with, and it goes back to that Peter Lynch study where, you know, his mutual fund did 20 plus percent for 20 years, but his average investor did much worse than that. I think the ultimate question you need to ask yourself when you buy a stock is if it fell, would I be excited? Would I be excited to buy more? If you right now think about um, some highly desirable item that you have in your life, I don't know, let's, let's say you want the new iPad or something. You know, you go to the store and it's $1,500. You say, okay, that's a little expensive for me. Let's say next day you go and suddenly the iPad is on sale for $800. You, you'd be so excited. You'd want to buy it. You'd say, okay, I understand. It's the same with stocks. And if you don't know the answer to that question, then you don't know the stock well enough to own it and you probably shouldn't. 
So it's just something to, uh, to consider as kind of like a final due diligence point after you've done all your qualitative and quantitative research. Um, these are some of my favorite books. Peter Lynch is the fellow I mentioned um, that you know was referenced in an earlier research study. He does a great job in this book talking about how people with no Wall Street experience can actually do better than the professionals. Um, I, I subscribe to this theory. It's a very good book. He talks about how you just basically walk around life. You see what your friends are buying, what they like, and that goes a long way in telling you which stocks you should focus on. I mean, some of you may remember when Apple first came out with the iPhone, there was lineups around the block at Rogers stores trying to get the iPhone. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of information that Peter Lynch speaks to. The Warren Buffett way, Warren Buffett is a famous investor. This is a great book with case studies of some of his most successful investments. And it really simplifies all the PE ratios I was talking about and quantitative, qualitative analysis, what he was seeing you know, when he bought Coca-Cola 50 years ago or whatever. I think it's a really helpful way um, to kind of get some good case studies in a very simplified format. Um, last thing I would say is, um, the annual report of companies can be found by just Googling it. Uh, I, I think it's a, a must before you buy any company to read their financial statements. Um, the, it's called a 10K in the United States. In Canada, it's just called an annual report. But uh, the 10K can seem complicated. So if you just Google how to read a 10K, um, there are some helpful websites there. Um, but it, uh, it's, it's a must. I mean, you have to understand uh, what you're buying. So an annual report is a great way to, and if you guys have any questions, um, you know, please put them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Great. Thanks, Adam. So thank you so much for um, giving the lecture today about, you know, this, how to stock pick, how to analyze a stock. I know that while a lot of us, we recommend to students to, if they are investing to, and look at an ETF, because that's kind of like, you know, uh, spreading out a wider net rather than trying to fish individual fish, right? So now you kind of can see um, how much effort that can go into uh, deciding on which stock to invest in. What are some of the mindset? Um, what do you kind of think about when you are investing, um, especially in a, in a particular stock? So I understand that, you know, there are going to be people out there, learners, uh, staff physicians who will be investing in individual stocks. They like doing the research of the stock. So hopefully this is just another resource for you when you're looking at doing some of that stock analysis for yourself.